Hi, everyone, if you could find your seats, we'd like to get the next panel started. Welcome back. Um, the name of this panel is uh, Jewish Arts in the Soviet Union. We'll first be hearing from James Leffler, Leffler, Associate Professor of History at the University of Virginia, followed by Harriet Mirav, who is the Professor of Slavic Language and Literatures and Comparative and World Literature um, at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and editor of Slavic Review. Um, please welcome Professor Leffler. Hi, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, like so many people, I'm indebted to um, everyone at EVO, uh, and Steve Zipperstein, and all the people who organized this conference. And like many people here, EVO has been uh, interwoven with my professional career uh, all the way through. So it's, it's a treat to be here at kind of a landmark event for the institution and um, for this topic. So uh, I want to begin with the anecdote behind the title of my talk. My name is not Monsieur, but Meshislav, Soviet Jewish Music Between Freedom and Constraint. Uh, so I'll begin with the anecdote, and it has to do with this composer uh, and his conversation with another composer. The Russian Jewish composer and musicologist Abram Yufsin spent many decades interviewing Soviet Jewish artists and intellectuals about their Jewish identities. In each case, he asked essentially the same question, what does your Jewishness mean to you? And over the years, he collected uh, short little snippets of replies from the likes of Vasily Grossman, Boris Slutsky, uh, Alexander Galich, Leonid Vuchosev, David Oistrakh, and Ilya Ehrenberg. And their answers ranged, but when he posed the question to the great Soviet Jewish composer Weinberg, he got only a short, terse reply, which is, my name is not Moisier, but Mechislav. Yusin found this an odd answer. After all, Jewishness was a constant theme throughout Weinberg's work. This was the man who set the poetry of Perix and Halkin to music. He wrote what could be called the first opera about the Holocaust. His string quartets and orchestral works pulsated with the sound of Jewish folklore. And he suffered deeply for his Jewishness and his ties to the Jewish cultural intelligentsia at the hands of Stalin. So Yusin wasn't content with this answer, and he pushed back and said, there must be more to the story. What about your Jewishness and your Jewish identity, he repeated. And Weinberg responded gruffly, I'll say it again, my name is not Moisier, but Mechislav. So now do you understand what that means for me and my identity? So there's nothing more Jewish, of course, than to answer a question with a question, right? Uh, and there's nothing more Jewish for a Jewish artist than to deny that his or her Jewishness matters to his art, regardless of what we may think. And of course, there's also nothing more Jewish, we might add, than to parse the Jewish identity of famous historical figures. You could see today's issue of Tablet, or yesterday's, or the day before, right? It's something we do as a, as a communal practice. But behind the testy reply of Weinberg lie two interesting questions that I want to explore in my remarks today. What does it mean that the man who might be called the most important Soviet Jewish composer of the 20th century hated to be called a Jewish composer? Uh, and what can that tell us about the larger meaning of 1917 for the fate of Jewish culture in the Soviet Union? The premise of this conference is that 1917 changed the, Jewish, the Jews of Russia in two paradoxical ways. First, uh, as we've heard, the Russian Revolution liberated the largest Jewish population in the world, yet directly produced a massacre in its opening years on a scale that the, wo the world had never seen before. Second, the revolution produced a, a unique pattern of Jewish mobility and achievement coupled uh, with a destructive effacement and destruction of the richness of that culture and many of its progenitors. So it's the second of those paradoxes I want to discuss today with specific reference to music. For Soviet Jewish musical history perfectly illustrates the paradox of simultaneous Jewish success and marginalization, freedom and constraint. Uh, these are themes I've tackled over the years. Uh, in my book several years ago, I talked about this uh, briefly for the sort of latter part of the story. Um, since that time, I've been involved in programming the music of Weinberg, um, not actively doing that anymore, 
um, but still thinking about what it means to program Jewish music today and present the heritage from Soviet Jewish culture to our world. Uh, and those experiences have often led me to puzzle, uh, like Yufsen, over Weinberg's Jewishness and how to situate him, uh, especially in light of the fact that he's grown to greater attention in recent years and the questions that have attached themselves to his growing reputation as well. Is he a Holocaust composer? Is he a composer who tells us something fundamental about Soviet Jewishness? Or does he not even fit our basic storyline at all, for reasons I'll mention? I've also puzzled over the odd mixture of freedom and constraint in his music. When we hear the words freedom and constraint today in reference to Soviet Jewish culture, I would hazard to guess that most, most of us translate constraint as persecution specifically anti-Semitism. And we ask what kind of Jewishness could be expressed in Soviet society, when and where. We ask what was legal, what was permissible, what was politically acceptable. In my remarks today, however, I want to suggest that when it came to music, at least, the constraints imposed on Jewish composers after the revolution were not just political or legal or anti-Semitic in the conventional sense. The largest constraint came from the very logic of Soviet culture. For the revolution that was supposed to wipe away the past, instead enshrined a pre-Soviet form of Russian imperial nationalism, which treated Jews like a national minority and stigmatized their musical Jewishness as a form of historical parochialism. Instead of liberating Jewish music, as many Jewish composer composers believed it might do, the revolution turned Jewish music into a kind of aesthetic trap with dire long-term consequences for these composers and for their art. The person who best e exemplifies this dilemma is Weinberg. And so I'm going to discuss uh, his identity and some of the issues that actually go into his naming. So there's a nice connection between some of the things I'll be mentioning and what we heard earlier actually about name changing um, for uh, the Soviet secret police and Jews in it. Uh, and naming and identity are, I think, one key into understanding him and perhaps the larger contours of the Soviet Jewish musical experience. Weinberg missed 1917 by a generation. He was born uh, in 1919, uh, nor did he immediately feel its touch because he was born in Warsaw to a father and mother who were recently arrived from uh, Bessarabia, where relatives had suffered through the Kishinev pogroms a decade before. His father was a Yiddish theater musician and composer and uh, who also worked as an arranger and accompanist throughout Polish Jewish musical culture. Young Moisha, as he was known, began playing professional piano at a young age moved into this Warsaw Conservatory, and then uh, in 1939, he fled to Minsk. In Minsk, he spent two years at the conservatory from 39 to 41. Uh, and interestingly, as a small parenthesis, the man in the middle of this picture, Vasily Zolotarov, uh, was his mentor there and the person who probably had the most decisive impact on his compositional development. Zolotarov was uh, a Russian composer who back in 1902 had done the first transcriptions of klezmer music, some of the first transcriptions to be used in writing orchestral music. He actually wrote an orchestral piece that was performed here in New York City in, if I'm not mistaken, 1904. So there was an interesting relationship, the non-Jewish Russian composer playing klezmer music, uh, excuse me, perf uh, composing klezmer-influenced music, and Weinberg moving into this orbit for these two decisive years that we still don't know that much about. In 41, the Nazis invaded and Weinberg fled again, and this time he ended up in Tashkent. There his life took a major turn as he entered both the Soviet Jewish and musical elites. He married the daughter of Solomon Mikhoyles uh, and his new father-in-law, of course the famous head of uh, the, the Moscow Yiddish Art Theater and probably um, after Babel might, might say the most important Soviet Jewish public figure uh, at this point in the 40s. Uh, his father in turn, father-in-law in turn, introduced him to Dmitry Shostakovich. Soon after, Shostakovich arranged for Weinberg to move to Moscow on the basis of some of his compositions, and the two composers practically lived side by side um, and almost inside one another's composing studios for the next several decades. Thereafter, Weinberg grew into a, an essential musical voice of his generation. And today, I'm not gonna talk too much about the details of his artistic reputation, but suffice it to say, uh, he's recognized by some as uh, up there with Prokofiev and Shostakovich as one of the great voices of Soviet classical music, as well as the question of um, who's the greatest and all that kind of thing enters into it, and I'll turn back to that. Um, what I want to talk about is the question, as I've said, of Jewishness. 
Um, he produced a massive output of klezmer-tinged string quartets, as I mentioned, song settings of Yiddish poetry, programmatic symphonies, uh, and all kinds of other things that already in the 40s were leading him to be described as, quote, a leading exponent of Jewish national music. Now that's from an Anakite uh, uh, article. Weinberg's Jewishness was one reason that he was swept up in the anti-Semitic, anti-cosmopolitan campaign in February 1953. His own father-in-law had been killed, obviously, at the beginning of that campaign, and at the very end of it, um, he found himself now arrested. Uh, Despite this, he continued, after being released, and he's released in March when Stalin dies, he continued to uh, sort of assertively explore Jewish thematics in his work uh, and to um, embrace them, but to reject the label. And that's the question I want to think about uh, for a few minutes now. Now, one answer to the question of why he would say I'm not a Jewish composer is why should he, right? Uh, many of the people that Yufsin, the musicologist I mentioned, interviewed expressed complicated blends of Russianness, Jewishness, Sovietness in their identities. Uh, but a complicated identity is not a wholly satisfying answer. And I don't think it fully explains the disjuncture between his evident enduring attachment to Jewishness, to making it explicit as a theme and a sound in his work, and his reflexive disavowal of a Jewish musical identity. There's a second answer to this question, which basically says, well, Weinberg was a loyal communist. And as we've heard again and again, and it's, it's, it's um, shown us uh, that the power of the Red Army to serve as a symbol of uh, protection, an actual form of protection, and then a stirring symbol for which Jews could identify through it to the state uh, was very palpable. Um, Weinberg credited the Red Army uh, with saving his life and stopping the spread of Nazi fascism which claimed the lives of many members of his family. But if the revolution redeemed him, it also quarantined him. And I don't think it explains again the full uh, question about his identity. So what else can we say? To explain this, I want to, for the remaining minutes, go back and talk for a few minutes about the idea of a musical revolution for Jewish composers, and then close by looking at Weinberg's a couple key moments where he begins to engage with this question of his place inside Sovietness and Soviet culture. For 10 years before the revolution, there was a circle of Russian Jewish composers based in St. Petersburg, Moscow, and elsewhere who pushed to create what they called a Jewish national school of classical music. And like everyone in our story here, they struggled with issues of Jewishness and Russianness. But their answer was to embrace their Jewishness, to highlight it, to elevate it into kind of a new redemptive ideology of modern national expression. Now, as I've chronicled elsewhere, they were accepted, but they were sort of quarantined as minority composers among the little peoples of the Russian Empire who could contribute but not really be legitimately Russian in their music. The Russian Revolution promised to change all of that. Here's Alexander Crane with quite a mustache um, who wrote in 1918 that the revolution had brought Jewish music back to life after thousands of years of assimilation. And the revolution promised now that the national ambitions for Jewish composers would seize all of the, uh, all of the Jewish talent, and a new era of Jewish cultural freedom was at hand. Now, this is a complicated story because for the next 10 years, Crane and his comrades did enjoy a high degree of state support, uh, prestige, and encouragement. Their music was published and promoted by the Soviet state at home and abroad and they rose up to the highest levels of uh, the conservatory system. When the purges hit, and this is one of the interesting things about musicians, they are much more insulated than other areas of the Jewish uh, artistic intelligentsia. And people continue to debate whether that was because certain key officials protected them uh, or other things having to do with the nature of music. But even in these periods of maximal freedom for them, they found themselves hemmed in as national minority artists and slotted into a lower rung in a cultural hierarchy. This was an old Russian imperial story, I would argue, that Russians can be the authentic performers, of, I should say exponents of their music, uh, and Jews can be minority composers who their music might contribute to the stream of Russianness, but they as composers are still gonna be marked as Armenian, as Uzbek, as Ukrainian, in a kind of second class cultural citizenship. 1917 was supposed to change that, but it didn't. And instead, I think it turned Jewishness in art music into a kind of ethnic straitjacket. Uh, this, I believe, is what Weinberg felt because he entered into the Soviet Union in 1939, having spent the first two decades of his life living in Poland, right, in a different context. Now, 
Weinberg got his first taste of this when he actually got to the border between Poland and Soviet Belarusia in 1939. And there's an anecdote he tells about that moment, which he told repeatedly over the course of his life in some fa fair amount of detail as revealing something about it. It goes like this. The officer asks him, your last name, Weinberg. Your first name, Mieczysław. What does Mieczysław mean? Are you a Jew? Yes, a Jew. That means you'll be called Moisier. <laughs> so he went on to recount that as soon as possible, he tried to remedy the situation. Um, and he didn't have any documents, so this is a kind of classic actual literary motif that, that you see repeated in many uh, parts of Russian Jewish literature. He didn't have his passport, he didn't have his birth certificate, he says, but he had his compositions. And then he goes on to say, as any graphological expert could have seen that the name on the compositions was Mieczysław Weinberg. And nevertheless, they wouldn't give me that name. But I tried my hardest to set the historical rec record straight. They took the trouble to give me the name, presumably my parents, and I, that meant I ought to use it. This little anecdote, I think, conveys something about how much it mattered to Weinberg and how much he didn't want to be stuck with a Jewish first name. The problem with this account is it's not at all clear that he was Mieczysław in Poland. Uh, his birth certificate lists him, let's see if I have this up here, uh, as Moisha, right? So, uh, and this is a copy of his birth certificate, which wasn't actually destroyed. Uh, and he was known in the theater, theater circles as Moisha. Now, it doesn't mean he wasn't also known as Mieczysław, um, uh, but he clearly had something that wasn't just a Polonized identity, right? Uh, more crucially, uh, after he arrived in the Soviet Union, he married into this family, and uh, he was also known throughout the Yiddish, uh, Soviet Yiddish press during the war years as Moisha Weinberg. Uh, now, also, there's another issue here, which is, of course, he didn't change his last name, right? So he's still Weinberg, and, and you wonder about uh, the surname versus uh, the first name and how this would have played out for him in terms of trying to dodge some aspects of his Jewishness. What I think this is is not really worrying about being too Jewish, but trying to hold on to a Polish identity, right, at this moment. And I think what happened in that 1939 moment, why it loomed up and why it became a big issue for him with naming, was this sense that Jewishness was a kind of trap uh, and that Polishness, even for someone obviously identified as a Soviet Jew, as a Jew, uh, as a Jewish musician, was somehow a way to mitigate that and push against that. The best example of this comes from one other anecdote I'll share with you, which happened on the night he was arrested, February 6, 1953. This was the night uh, of the premiere of Weinberg's Moldavian Rhapsody uh, at Markovsky's Tchaikovsky Hall with David Oistrakh as the soloist, orchestral version. Um, Moldavian Rhapsody, I can't help but also note that this is a piece that, as far as I could tell, was originally called uh, Yevreski, uh, uh, Rhapsody, um, and then he changed it from Jewish Rhapsody to Moldovian Rhapsody in order to kind of play with the censors. Uh, it's very Klezmer-esque, you might say. So the premiere was that night, and Weinberg and his friends had just returned home for a celebratory dinner. At two in the morning, there was a knock at the door. His wife and sister-in-law thought that it was, uh, you know, the secret police coming for them, but they were coming for Feinberg. He was at the piano playing and improvising, and of course, almost in a stylized version, they came through the door and said, hands up. Uh, and he stood up and asked what the charge was, and he was told, quote, Jewish bourgeois nationalism. And famously, he replied, Jewish nationalism? Since I don't know a single letter of the Yiddish alphabet, but I have 2,000 books in Polish on my shelves here, shouldn't you make, better make it Polish bourgeois nationalism? And their reply was, we know better than you. <laughs> so then he calmly put on his coat, took off his belt and tie, and said, dear friends, I'm not guilty of anything. Please excuse me. So a month later, Stalin had died, and Weinberg was released. Uh, here's the Spravka for his rehabilitation, which it also you'll see for those of you who can read the uh, Russian and can see it up here, is Weinberg Moisier Mecheslav. So maybe that's a triumph for him, that he got Mecheslav into it. Um, the circumstances, I'm intrigued, as I think many people might be hearing this and thinking about this in dialogue with some of the earlier papers, there's more to be said about the circumstances of his arrest and his release, um, and as well as what happened with others advocating for him. But to sum up here, I want to address basically the larger issues that keep surfacing in these key moments in his life when he thinks about his name and, and asks to be called and understood one way or another. As I've said, he keeps composing for decades and Jewishness keeps surfacing in his music. 
but he rejects attempts to label his music Jewish, and at this critical moment, he says, call me a Polish nationalist, right? Um, he's not being honest, he wasn't, and this is the anecdote, of course, he's telling us, but it's not an honest uh, answer that he doesn't know the Yiddish alphabet, right? But it's very important him, to him to avoid the Jewish label. Uh, I would say the consequences of this for Weinberg in particular was that he lived in a particular state of tension with himself. Uh, and he also exists and continues to exist in an awkward relationship to Jewishness in Soviet art music. And this is all the more true if you want to compare him to the other person in his life who becomes arguably the greatest exponent of Jewish music in the Soviet Union, and this is, of course, Shostakovich. So I want to close with a final word about Shostakovich and the larger meaning of some of these issues I've raised today. It's almost impossible to mention Weinberg today. I defy you to show me a uh, newspaper review in the New York Times or a playbill booklet of music of Weinberg being performed that doesn't basically in the next sentence mention Shostakovich, right? Uh, and the conventional wisdom is that this was basically a very, very close relationship between them. Um, and that they actually somewhat finished each other's sentences, that they quote one another's musical works, that it's sometimes hard to know who wrote what work first, and so on and so forth. Uh, but there's also a sense that basically Weinberg was somehow in Shostakovich's shadow, or more crassly uh, and unfairly, that he's a second-rate version of him, that he's a Jewish Shostakovich. Uh, I think this ignores something vital that I and other scholars have begun to explore, which is that basically uh, it appears that Weinberg really taught Shostakovich about the expressive potential of Jewish musical folklore. He's not the only source, but he was a unique source at a unique juncture when Shostakovich is beginning to search for new uh, sources of symbolic creativity to create his style for what Soviet music could become in Soviet modernism. Today, when we look for the sound of the revolution, I think many of us would say the sound of the revolution, the sound of the terror, the sound of World War II, and the sound of the tangled fates of Russians and Jews and the Holocaust, uh, we listen and look to the music of Shostakovich. Uh, and Jewishness in Shostakovich's music is also a kind of a key node in, in figuring out what he means by it, what his message was, how much it was an explicit critique, and so on and so forth. Uh, Weinberg, by contrast, is still this ambiguous person who's tagged. He's kind of a half victim, half survivor. Um, he's somebody who doesn't quite fit perfectly into the Russian and Soviet canon. Uh, and he's someone who basically seems to be uh, almost always an adjunct to the story. And I want to suggest that basically what really happens with the revolution, what Weinberg's dilemma is, and what the Polishness is an attempt to escape, is basically he realized that he's moving into an imperial framework where his musicality and his Jewishness uh, is always going to be meaning something, mean something different when it comes out of his uh, pen versus that of Shostakovich. And Shostakovich lords over Soviet music kind of as a pure Russian borrowing of Jewishness to tell us something about Russianness. Uh, and this is something that always eludes Weinberg. Perhaps true, that's why Moisha preferred to be Mecheslav rather than Moisier, for ultimately he lived in the century of Dmitri. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to join the chorus thanking the uh, organizers. And of course, I'd like to add an extra thanks to Alex and also uh, Olivia for uh, getting, getting me uh, here. Uh, the title of my talk, a little different from the program, to, uh, it's called The Strangeness of Neighborly Relations in Itzik Kipnis's Months and Days. This is Kipnis. This is a somewhat distorted Chadosh Menteg cover. This is the opening from which I'll read a small uh, translation. 2,000 days passed since then, 2,000 days and 2,000 nights, 
days like brass, disks shining in the sun, and nights like sated deer, stock still for hours, or maybe the opposite. Days like foreheads bruised and broken, and nights like cups of oleum tipped onto animal skins, poisonous sulfuric acid that flows, burns, and brings death. In any case, the first thousand days and nights were like that, and before then, it was summer. Summer with blossoming days like poppies in June. I had just gotten married. As the passage that opens the 1926 version of Kipnis's Yiddish novel, Hadoshim and Teg, Mieseci i Dni, a Russian translation was published. As the passage suggests, the novel chronicles, it's, that's the subtitle, violence and desire by intertwining two incommensurable stories, the author's honeymoon and the 1919 pogroms in Ovruch and Slavyeshna. Ovruch is around 119 miles northwest of Kiev. Kipnis addresses readers with direct questions. For example, is slitting someone's throat the same as slaughtering a cow? Readers thus must imagine the steps necessary for the destruction of life, for the transformation of neighbors into enemies, the unmaking of daily life, and as I will show, the opposite, it's remaking. So my argument is to focus on the strangeness of world-destroying violence and the strangeness of world-remaking neighborly care. Kipnis was born in Slavyechna in 1896 and died in Kiev in 1974. He worked as a leather tanner, as the passage reveals, until the Leather Workers Union sent him to Kiev to study in 1920. Months and Days was the first work for which Kipnis received significant critical attention. He was very widely known in Yiddish and Russian as a children's author. His mother-in-law and two of her children were killed in the pogrom in 1919. His first wife, Buzi, as the opening ich and Buzi, pregnant at the time, later died of typhus after giving birth to their daughter. One eyewitness reported 68 killed and 45 wounded in Slavyechna. Other reports give different numbers, more than 60 killed and more than 100 wounded. Kipnis, strangely, names the names of victims and perpetrators real names, lamenting the first and calling for revenge against the second. And yet, in a postscript to the novel, comments on the strangeness, his word, of seeing orphaned children, the victims of pogrom violence and its retribution, eating together at feeding stations. Quote, it was a bit strange, a bissel modna, for the grown-ups to contemplate this. Indeed, gor zeir modna. Indeed, even very strange. So taking a cue from Kipnis, my new project, Archive of Violence, the Witness Literature, of the Russian Civil War explores the strangeness of neighborly relations enacted both in violence, as suggested by the opening, and in the potential for neighborly reconciliation, as in the postscript. In my remarks today, I focus on a few moments of strangeness in the artistic text that Kipnis produced and the larger archival record. My theoretical point of departure comes from Eric Santner's concept of creatureliness. Uh, this is in a book about Siebold, Benjamin, and other writers, mostly in response to World War II, but I'm borrowing some concepts. So creatureliness is a condition proximate to animal life, a subjection to power that takes place not only in the state of exception, or what I will call hyperlegality, as in Hitler's Germany, but also, I argue, when law and social meaning collapse, hupo legality, as was the case in Ukraine in 1919. I use Santner because he offers an alternative to the condition of bare life, homo soccer, theorized by Giorgio Agamben, and also because I believe the conditions of pogrom violence are not those of the death camp. Furthermore, unlike other theorists of violence, Santner suggests the potential for intervention in creatureliness or neighborly care. The Kiev Di District Commission of the Jewish Public Committee for Relief to Victims of Pogroms, compiled in the immediate aftermath of the violence, contains reports, first-person accounts from survivors, 
and records of legal proceedings, violating literary convention in Yiddish and in Russian, kipnis, names, real life victims, and perpetrators in months and days. So the same names appear in the Kiev District Commission archive and in Kipnis's artistic text. So Kipnis describes a woman wandering the shtetl, maddened by grief, who sings a dirge about her husband, her dead husband, David Frank. So in the Kiev District Commission archive, you can find exactly this individual, David Yevseyevich Frank, age 28, occupation Taylor. It's the third name from the top of the slide, if it's, if it's visible to you. Kipnis also chronicles the documentary process itself by mentioning an unfamiliar man walking around the shtetl taking notes. In 1926, the literary critic Isaac Nusinov, executed in 1952, called Kipnis's novel a rare witness aidus to the tragedy of 1919. So what does it mean to be a witness before the wit era of the witness, the era of the Holocaust? Kipnis's self-styled chronicle straddles the border between fact and fiction in incorporating names, dates, and, and addresses into his artistic narrative. Kipnis was responding to the new aesthetic of the 1920s, while previous authors, for example, in the 19th century, could only imagine a better world. The new Soviet state could and did send writers and visual artists to construction sites and agricultural settlements to document and thus promote the production of the new, better socialist world. On September 16, 1921, the Information and Statistical Division of the Jewish Public Committee for Assisting Pogrom Victims considered a proposal from the Yiddish poet, David Hofstein, to employ literary artists to document the pogroms in Ukraine. Hofstein suggested that Jewish authors return to their native shtetls to gather information about pogroms, quote, in the form of a chronicle, which should contain not only the factual side of pogroms, but also a description. So the term chronicle, as we recall, appears in the subtitle of Chadoshim Unteg, and it is very likely that Kipnis, who was Hofstein's protege, was fulfilling his mentor's request. Thus, the relationship between two human beings enters the very constitution of the artistic text, and thus into the constitution of the witness as a witness. So my project in larger scale seeks not only to contribute to the conceptualization of violence, but also to our understanding of witness literature before the so-called crisis of representation of the Holocaust. In months and days, Kipnis registers 1917 by saying, who doesn't know that in Russia, in Rusland, it's been a year since the Great Revolution? Of course we know, but no revolutions occurred in the places where we live. The reports in the Kiev District Commission archive and Kipnis' own novel describe common economic conditions shared by Jews and non-Jews in Slavyechna. Um, there were approximately uh, 1,475 inhabitants in 1919, out of which around 905 were Jews. As one witness put it, quote, the Jews worked just like the peasants. They walked bent over and were tattered and oppressed. The town included a mill, several tanneries, a slaughterhouse, a church, and two Jewish cemeteries. One of the causes for Jewish poverty pre-pogrom was immigration. Kipnis's mother-in-law, whose husband was in the US, traveled to nearby villages and settlements on foot, selling dishes and plates to the peasants. Um, Jews and non-Jews not only lived next door to one another, they knew one another, and they lived peaceably, as uh, Alyssa Bemperad has, has also talked to us about. Uh, before 1919, in July, to use Kipnis's words, there was every indication that the Jews and non-Jews would live together until the Messiah came. They did not do so, however. But that they could have is important, and I'm going to return to this point later. Kipnis blames the eruption of violence in his native shtetl on his neighbor, Marco Luchtman, also, uh, who was the chief of police, an individual named Kasienko or Kasinka, uh, the archive uses both variants, in addition to peasants from the surrounding region. 
Um, so all of these names that I've just mentioned appear in the archival record. Um, Kasienko was a young man of 19 or 20, unusually. He was literate and worked for a time as a clerk for the food board. In the period before July 1919, he had no definite occupation, but then joined the local police. Together with the police chief, began an anti-Semitic ca agitation campaign. Jews were going to seize churches, transform them into synagogues, force peasants to register marriages and births with rabbis, and Jews also were hoarding manufactured goods, particularly salt, and salt is a flashpoint. I'm going to come back to it. Various explanations have been given for the anti-Jewish violence in Ukraine, including the backdrop of World War I, the anti-Jewish sentiments and policies of the Imperial Army that deported thousands of Jews during the war, paved the way for the brutality in the same region in the immediate aftermath. That's Oleg Budnitsky. Uh, this was the shatter zone of empires. Uh, this is another historian. The period of 1918 to 1921 is but one phase of a, quote, continuum of conflict that began in World War I and continued through World War II. Uh, there was a larger context of violence, which I think is extremely important. As Peter Holquist puts it, the practices of total war conducted by Bolsheviks, including military combat, forced appropriation of material goods, and summary executions conducted by different branches of the new government as Bolsheviks struggled to establish power, anti-Bolshevik sentiment, the desire for land, the availability of weapons, and the prolonged absence of a central authority in Ukraine were amongst the most important factors leading to the pogroms. Too much emphasis on context, however, make the pogroms inevitable and necessary, part of the landscape of the, quote, bloodlands, even though Tim Snyder doesn't talk about the Civil War. My approach, I hope, takes this context into, into consideration, uses it, but also uses artistic literature, personal testimonies, and theories derived both from political theology and psychoanalysis to offer other additional factors that led to both pogrom violence and its mitigation. And I'm especially interested in exploring the breaks in the continuum of violence, the not depressing parts, and I, I want to push against the notion of inevitability of violence. Um, not to dwell, but just to say two more words about Santner and creatureliness. Creatureliness is vulnerability to biopower, a condition wherein life and the flesh are the concern of politics. This is always the case after, the, after we enter the modern period, but Santner describes a heightened biopolitical intensity in creaturely existence. Biopower arises in the transition from the power of the single sovereign, the king, to the sovereignty of the people and the modern administrative state. In 1917, of course, this transition happened very quickly. It never really happened fully. And it also, another way of talking about it is to say it happened over and over again. In Ukraine and other regions in 1918, 1919, where there was no law and no sovereignty, anybody could be king for a day so to speak, and perpetrators of anti-Jewish violence embraced the theatricality of their temporary royalty. Alexander, Adaman Alexander Kozer Zirka, for example, forced Jews to sing, dance, and slap each other while he watched from his bed, the strangeness of violence. During the pogrom, as it is described in Months and Days, Kipnis finds himself in the condition of creatureliness, he uses the very word. Remarking on the difficulty of figuring out where to sleep, he says, it's seine mir geglichen zu Bashefanischen, was im Oven während den ganzen Hefker und Hilflos, something like we were like creatures who at nightfall became abandoned and utterly helpless. Note first the term creatures, Bashefanischen, not merely animals, but particular creatures whose creator and master leaves them up for grabs, the term Hefker. Hefker designates an object that has no owner and therefore by, by Jewish law exempt from laws that would normally apply to the condition of mastery or ownership, including, for example, taxes. If an object is Hefker, you don't have to pay taxes. Hefker designates a legal category of lawlessness, hypolegality, 
with, that is within the law, the boundary condition which the creature is subject to another's excesses. Neighborly love, writes Santner, has to do with solidarity with this creaturely expressivity that makes the other strange, not only to me, but to him or herself. So here's a moment of strangeness. One of the nights of the pogrom, Itzik Kipnis and his whole family are seeking shelter in a neighboring village. They enter the courtyard of a, a peasant family. An old woman, not Jewish, appears from one of the houses. She, she looks very strange. She's half naked. She's wearing only a canvas shirt and two aprons, one in front, one in back. That's her clothing. This is Kipnis. She cries and she laments and she says that it's uh, the fault of the war that her own people have learned to live on other people's possessions. She says also Jews are guilty because they hid salt. Kipnis also describes a problem with salt. He said that peasants would exchange an entire wagon load of wood for a bit of salt, which was frequently adulterated with chalk, flour, saccharin, and dye. The old woman points out that even animals, behemoths, receive salt and goes on to say the people are angry at the Jews because of the salt. And then she goes and brings out baked potatoes for the Jewish children. The whole miniature, so this is a miniature that could have ended very differently. There's a crescendo to violence. Uh, the people are mad at you. I'm mad at you. It's the Jews' fault. They hid salt. You don't expect this strange old woman to come and bring food. So the woman herself and her action are strange in the sense of breaking with expectations that the larger narrative sets up that is violence that leads to more violence. The episode suggests that the continuing of violence was not necessarily a continuum. The bloodlines did not penetrate every speck of available space. Now let me return to the postscript. This is Kipnis's postscript. This is a picture from the Joint Distribution Committee. Marco, who's a real person, Luftmann, had murdered Jews and Jews murdered Marco. And the orphan children came running with their bowls to the kitchen. They didn't think about anything. They only lifted their eyes and mouths to the food. For the grown-ups, and I said this already, it was a strange sight, Gormodna, a very strange sight. The strangeness of the scene requires a little explanation. In the midst of ongoing violence, time, space, and human beings lose their ordinary qualities. The distinction between life and death vanished as the living struggled to stay alive by pretending to be dead. The fundamental categories of experience, time, and space lose their definitions. To quote Kipnis, Tuesday was a day, and we, it seemed, were human beings. The affirmation of the day of the week and the self-affirmation of the creatures as human beings mentioned reflects the radical doubt that this is in fact the case. The act of eating appears strange. Kipnis's description emphasizes its animality. The children don't even think, they just eat. What is strange in this scene is the same thing that is strange about the old woman who wears two aprons, one in front and one in back. When unthinkable violence is taking place, neighborly care is also unthinkable, strange. When violence unmakes the world, remaking it requires another adjustment, a shift in what we expect. Imagination, literary work, reveals both strange, the strangeness of violence and the strangeness of neighborly care. Thank you. We have um, a few minutes for questions. Yeah, um, these are great talks. Harriet, I really, I was really fascinated by your talk. And I think that um, it's, it's, it's interesting how many of the really well-known pogrom texts in, um, in Russian or in Yiddish are produced by people who were not there at the time, who came later and you know, gathered testimony from other people. Um, and I wonder whether this um, kind of awareness of creatureliness and um, the remaking of the world is more accessible to or more interesting to 
people who were there at the time, such as Goodness, who are less likely to kind of fall into a, a narrative that excludes that, which might be more the case with, you know, Bialik or Markish. I think uh, the genre that Bialik was working in, in his poem, not his notebooks, pretty much precluded the flesh. It was emotion, it's shame. The dominant you know, metaphor is horror and shame. Markish is arguably, Dikupa you mean, Dikupa, right? It's a mount. I mean, it's, it's all about the flesh. It's very fleshy. And uh, 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 flesh disassociated, disassociated from, from human beings. So, uh, uh, m you know, Markish was a veteran of World War I. He had plenty of experience of the flesh. So uh, may maybe there is something there that, that definitely, I think, you're right, is not, is not in, is not in uh, Bialik. Returning to Bialik, um, a lot of the interplay that you described here, Eric, um, is, is evident in Bialik's notebooks as well, and uh, which, which you may have reviewed. The, certainly the interplay between familiarity and violence, but also the contingency of violence, the way in which he describes how uh, Jews, especially in Lower Kishnev, in the so-called Old Town, in order to escape pogromists, would actually um, climb into courtyards of, of non-Jewish neighbors with the full expectation that they would be hidden. And as often as not, they were. And, um, and so it's just that interplay, that the role of contingency, the unpredictability, mm -hmm. the fact that actually despite the, 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 the general narrative <coughs> about the Kishna pogrom, so many Jews are actually hidden by non-Jews uh, who risk their lives um, in the midst of the mayhem. And so very, very similar kind of interplay that you described. I haven't reviewed the notebooks of, of Bialik, but I know from other descriptions in the Kiev Commission archive that sometimes neighbors would warn Jews, Struk is coming, his forces are coming, and the Jews didn't believe them. So uh, you, could be, you could go that way and be killed and go that way and, and be safe. Abs contingency, a key, key term. Okay, thank you. These were really two uh, wonderful presentations. Uh, I'd like to ask Professor Leffler uh, something about Shostakovich. So Shostakovich seems to have gone from being in favor with Stalin to out of favor, in favor, back and forth. Why was he such a lightning rod uh, with Stalin? And could you relate it especially to some of the symphonies uh, that he wrote to brought him in and out of favor? Sure. So uh, there's a lot of ways to answer that. Um, one is to say the the uh, as we've heard in some of the other talks today, you know, the unique power of art in Soviet society and Shostakovich's artistic talent gives him a power that sh that Stalin wants to co-opt at times and he you know, wants to control at others, and that can explain some of it. Uh, some of it also very much in the vein of, of what Jonathan Brent spoke to us about has to do with some of the questions of um, cultural diplomacy and Shostakovich is useful in light of his prestige abroad uh, that uh, Stalin wants to make use of that, um, you know, to send him abroad and to treat him in certain ways that befit uh, this is what the Soviet Union can do for art, for the cause of art, right? Um, and it's a way to show uh, the rest of the world, because it's one of the great exports the Soviet Union has going for it, right, is, is, is Shostakovich's music. The, uh, for the sake of time, I, don't, I can't get quite into the symphonies, but it, it does, as you, as you ask in your question, you highlight the fact it does vary dramatically. Um, and the question is often asked, and I don't think we have a good answer, how, how far does it vary? Meaning, you know, um, when we wonder about Shostakovich's own commitments and how much he is willing and able to challenge Stalin over issues, you know, there's still, I think the jury is still out to some extent because he got caught up, the, our, our understanding of Shostakovich got caught up in some late Cold War debates about um, him and uh, uh, what he really felt. Um, so it's hard to know um, what's going on between them. 
and how much he is free. You know, my, my subtitle is Constrained Freedom, how free he was. Um, I'm arguing he's certainly free to do things with Jewishness and Jewish music that other Jewish composers can't, which is an interesting irony. Um, but how free he is and how, uh, how much he goes in and out of favor, um, I think we still await, hopefully, um, more discussion on that. A great question, something else that we don't have an answer yet to. On the one hand, you could say it's inevitable. Everyone around him was arrested. His father-in-law, you know, all of the other members of the Jewish artistic intelligentsia, they accused him of being, I mean, the, one of the charges was uh, the effort to create the CIA-Israeli joint, you know, um, backed uh, breakaway Crimean Republic. Right? So they used that whole charge against him. And the proof was the possession of Jewish musical manuscripts. So uh, that was you know, um, one of the charges. I've never seen the full charge sheet. I expect we will see it. There's a biography, a major study of him in the works, slowly developing. Um, and there are more scholars also looking at his Polish phase and stuff like that. But we don't know for sure. And I would caution us, because we heard so nicely about Babel today, it's often hard to figure out. There's the, uh, I, I, I think we should move away from inevitability narratives and try and see the contingency, because he's arrested very much late in the game. And uh, also, it's notable that there are some other Jewish composers who end up arrested and purged, but many more are not. Uh, and that's uh, given rise to the question then, um, if, if that's the case, why was he singled out? Did Shostakovich let him down? Did uh, Hrenikov, one of the other commissars who had the power in theory to avert the decree, not intervene? Um, or was it that he actually played, you know, danced too close to the edge? We have perhaps time for one more question. Thank you very much for two uh, really wonderful papers. I had a question actually for James, which is about appropriation of other national traditions and the Soviet Union. I mean, I suppose the name that comes to mind is Hachaturian, isn't it? Because we're talking there about somebody who makes a career on national music and how that also becomes, becomes a trap. And I also wonder, I mean, just out of sheer na naivety about what happens to Roma music and the, the Soviet Union, because there's such a long tradition of appropriating Roma music. I mean, one thinks of that in Hungary, and it goes back to the 19th century as well. And right. um, I mean, of course, it's a little bit off the um, what you've been talking about, but I think it is, it is quite important sometimes to see in, in a broader imperial context these yeah. sort of patterns which are um, happening to, to different nationalities at the same time. Uh, thank you. Absolutely. I couldn't speak to Roma music, but what I do think is interesting is it doesn't get the same elevation into art music status that other uh, national minority traditions do. That's a question why it doesn't, um, because it still is, you know, um, it keeps going as a tradition. Um, uh, so uh, absolutely, that uh, imperial dynamic is there. Um, many of these composers, and including Weinberg, have another way out, which is to basically do something that we often forget about, which is to say, not just to write, try and write Jewish or not write Jewish, but to actually go write, you know, to set uh, uh, Kyrgyz folk songs too, right? So they can practice the same process of what we might call an imperial tradition. Um, and play with their own ambiguous status as, you know, Russified and yet um, still a minority people. And I think that's something that many Jewish composers do. The people I've looked at more specifically, like Mikhail Gnesin, make a career out of that in his later phase. Um, and also play with that question of what's Oriental and what isn't, right? Um, it's clear that when many of these composers are doing this, they're pushing us back to something that uh, Harry Morava has drawn our attention to, which is the challenge, I think, of, of reception um, and listening and how Soviets learn to listen and hear, hear these musical styles as, re as coded messages, right? We know this from Shostakovich studies, but it's true for every composer. Um, and it, it produces odd debates where people, you know, um, it, it cuts both ways. On the one hand, you can then do that and disguise your music. On the other hand, you're always in danger of being accused, as some of these composers were, of, of secretly including the Israeli national anthem in their works, even when it's not there, right? And there are ferocious debates about, the, you know, people are slipping in Hasidic music uh, into, their, into, their, uh, into their orchestral works. Um, so it becomes a real interesting problem of that. Um, but I would say one other thing, which is um, to your point, and that's that um, 
what allows, uh, in, in, the, in light of the anti-cosmopolitan campaign, what allows Weinberg to still keep writing music that sounds to many of his listeners explicitly Jewish? And part of the reception in, in Sovietska Musica and some of the, you know, the official establishment journals is to say this is part of a grand tradition, they'll even say this in the 50s, of Russian music taking its own Vostok and, and incorporating its own Vostok. So they can kind of justify having these Jewish elements there because that's Russian, that's a Russian um, musical act. You know, and it, it's a weird way in which even the Russian um, nationalism as it's resurfacing and closing off certain things is able to find a space for it inside Jewish music. I personally think that's why Shostakovich is able to play with that so much in his own compositions to kind of flirt with that and to use it um, in, a, in an acceptable way. All right, we're going to take a break for lunch. We'll see everyone about 2 o'clock.